All right, are we about ready to start? Okay, um, welcome to the uh, deep dive on the modular layer two OpenStack Neutron plugin. I'm Bob Kokora from Red Hat. This is Kyle Mestri from Cisco. And uh, we're gonna co-present. So why are you here? Why are we all here? Um, that doesn't really look like Hong Kong's uh, beachfront, but uh, it'll do. So um, many of you may be here because you've heard that some of the plugins you might be using, Open vSwitch and Linux Bridge, are being deprecated. Uh, Want to find out what's, what they're getting replaced with? Valid reason. You may also have heard that it, that it has some uh, capabilities that are interesting. We'll learn about those. And you may not know anything about it, but just want to learn about it, see what it does. So um, we'll get on with that. Um, so what is it? What is Modular Layer 2? It's a new Neutron Core plugin. It's uh, released in Havana. It's the default plugin that runs if you run DevStack and, and don't uh, choose a plugin. Um, it's modular. It has drivers. So the plugin itself does very little. It's built up of drivers. Uh, there's drivers for different network types, things like VLANs, GRE tunnels, uh, so forth. And there's drivers for mechanisms. So mechanisms would be things like the, the layer two agents or potentially talking to a, an SDN controller. Um, uh, also, there's drivers to talk to hardware like top of rack switches that might work in conjunction with other, other uh, drivers. So um, one other thing with, with uh, the modularity of, of this plugin is that the uh, layer 3 routing is handled as a service plugin, so that gives you the option of, of leaving it out or p picking among different implementations. So the modular layer 2 plugin, uh, we mentioned that those, uh, those existing plugins were being deprecated. Um, their agents are not being deprecated. So this is really just the plugin side. The, the uh, OpenV Switch, Linux Bridge, Hyper-V agents are all supported by this plugin. Those will continue to evolve. Uh, and ML2 will support new features in them. And uh, as, as we mentioned, the, the existing monolithic plugins uh, listed there are being deprecated. Hyper-V is sort of up to, up to the maintainers of you know, at what point they want to decide to deprecate it if they do. Kyle? So I think the next section of the talk will talk about the motivations for why we decided to do the modular layer 2 plugin. So as, as this slide shows, before the modular layer 2 plugin, if you were going to use OpenStack Neutron, you, know, you were limited to the Open vSwitch plugin, you know, or the Linux Bridge plugin, or vendor X, or vendor Y. Neutron effectively supported a single plugin at a time. So this was, this was kind of a big limitation, I think, that a lot of people saw, especially people that wanted to deploy and use multiple technologies. Now, whether that was multiple different vendor technologies, or even multiple hypervisors with different technologies like Hyper-V uh, and KVM or VMware. So the modular layer 2 plugin was designed to, to solve this problem by allowing for multiple mechanism drivers uh, to work at the same time and by uh, implementing the port binding API, which Bob is going to talk about later, so when VMs are, uh, their VIFs are bound on hosts, um, they'll be bound to the right driver. So, um, you know, this, this slide is speaking maybe to future plugin writers, people who want to interact. So before the modular layer 2 plugin, you had your Neutron server with, with your different plugins. Now a new vendor, a new open source uh, implementation, whatever comes along and says, you know, so I want to write a Neutron plugin. Hey, that's great. Welcome to Neutron, right? You know, but, but wait a sec, I'm duplicating a lot of code. There's a lot of database code, segmentation code. If you look at a lot of the plugins, a lot of that is duplicated. So, you know, now you might be bummed, right? What a pain, I'm duplicating all this work. So ML2 was designed to, to kind of take a lot of that duplicate code, a lot of that duplicate effort, and move it out into a common area so that people can focus on enabling the specific mechanisms for their Neutron implementations, whether that's, like I said, a vendor implementation or an open source implementation. So this is, this is kind of the three main use cases I think that we see with, with ML2 at this point. Um, you know, replacing the, the monolithic plugins, as we've already talked about, eliminating a lot of the, the duplicate code, um, reducing um, both development and maintenance effort. 
that's actually a really huge thing as well because it also reduces test coverage because a lot of the duplicate code had duplicate test coverage, which increases unit test runtime. Um, it leads to a lot of kind of undesirable side effects as well. So ML2 also enables these new features in addition as well, whether that's things like top of rack switch control. Um, there's actually a really, really great feature that was implemented in, in ML2 called L2 population, which we'll talk about later, which is um, effectively is avoiding uh, tunnel flooding um, and, and doing some interesting things there. Um, you know, and there's certainly more to come. The, the ice house uh, design site, uh, cycle will see a lot of interesting ML2 innovations as well. And then like I indicated before as well, I think the heterogeneous deployment um, is also a really good use case and another reason why people should look at the ML2 plugin for their Neutron deployments as well. Um, whether that's different appliances, different as a service appliances or hypervisors, or all kinds of new technology as well. Okay, Bob. That's good. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk for a couple minutes about the uh, Module Layer 2 architecture. Uh, this is advertised as a deep dive, um, but so we'll get, get some detail there. Um, this is just a quote from the README. Uh, it's, it's a framework, so just emphasizing that uh, the plugin itself does very little. It's a framework for these drivers. They, that's where all the, uh, the interesting bits are. Uh, and it supports uh, a variety of technologies concurrently, um, supporting complex use cases as well as simple ones. So how, how is ML2 similar to the existing uh, plugins that it's deprecating? Um, it's basically a superset of the functionality that each of these monolithic plugins provides. It's based on the, the Neutron DB plugin V2 base class. That class manages all the uh, database state models having to do with uh, you know, the, the, the Neutron resources, port, network, subnet. So a lot of, pretty much the same code handling all that, very little different in that case. Uh, it models the network in terms of provider attributes. So as an admin, when you look at a network, you'll usually see, depending on the plugin you're using, but uh, network type, uh, segmentation ID, physical network attributes that, that might be describing VLANs or GRE tunnels or, or whatever. Um, so it, it uses that same type of approach. Uh, it supports the RPC interface that the existing Layer 2 agents use. There was a little work in Havana to align those so that they could all talk to the same plugin, but uh, very minor changes uh, that were done in a backward compatible way. And uh, you know, it supports almost all the same extension APIs as those uh, existing plugins. So what's different? Um, so in order to achieve its goals that Kyle talked about, there are a number of excuse me, innovations introduced. Uh, one is really the clean separation of the management of network types from the management of mechanisms for accessing those networks. Uh, basically, each of those is a different type of driver, and uh, sets of those drivers are, are loaded at runtime and, and available for use. Um, you know, a, a new vendor plugin or, or open source plugin that, that needs new network types can add those, but oftentimes the same network type will be supported by a number of different mechanisms. You know, in the same way that Linux Bridge and Open vSwitch and Hyper-V all can talk about VLANs, there's just one VLAN type driver so that the notion of VLAN is kind of independent of which mechanisms are being used to access it. So uh, that access can, can not only be you know, one or the other as you would with the, with, with the uh, monolithic plugins, they can be accessed concurrently. So it is possible to build a, a neutron deployment that has maybe Nova cells, some of which are using uh, a KVM hypervisor and others using a Hyper-V hypervisor or something like that uh, to where the same VLANs, the same tenant networks, same provider networks, uh, are accessed by different mechanisms at the same time. And from a networking perspective, those are, those are uh, all seamlessly integrated. Also, features such as what Kyle was talking about with the layer two population, uh, controlling top of rack switches, things like that, that, those also can be packaged and configured as mechanism drivers. Uh, they, they get their hooks into the, into the system that way to know about the, the operations going on related to the neutron core resources. And so they, they, they can uh, add that. The nice thing there is the, those might be features you need, you configure them in, they might be experimental, you don't want to use them in your deployment, uh, all, all just controlled by whether you configure those drivers for, uh, for the, the Neutron server. Um, 
Another major innovation here is the support for multi-segment networks. With the previous monolithic plugins, a network was either a VLAN or a GRE network or a local network. Um, and with, with ML2, it can model networks made up of different segments that have different details in different places, and connecting to the network can be achieved by connecting to any of those segments. Uh, that's, that's still one L2 broadcast domain. We'll talk about that in a little more detail in a, in, in a slide that's coming up. Port binding, that's the aspect that uh, was also mentioned of how uh, when, when Nova launches a, a, an instance and the VIF port, the, the virtual interfaces are bound, um, the interaction with the plugin and deciding kind of which segment they connect to, uh, what, uh, what details are, are involved there, what drivers used in the, gener uh, in the generic, Nova's generic VIF driver, those sorts of things. So we'll talk about that in more detail. And then, uh, again, also the one innovation here is that the L3 router is, is pulled out and treated as a service plugin. So no real change there, but more flexibility for, for deployments. So this diagram here shows a little bit of uh, what the Neutron server looks like when running the ML2 plugin. So here's the server code. Uh, the ML2 plugin here, the various extensions, these are all you know, shared. This is, this is all code that... Uh, it's very similar to other plugins. So the structure of the Neutron, of the ML2 plugin itself is really made up of a type manager and a mechanism manager. And then uh, in the Havana release, there's a set of uh, various type drivers, GRE, VLAN, VXLAN are listed here. There's a few more. Uh, the mechanism manager then manages a set of uh, mechanism drivers. There's a couple different categories here. We see here Open vSwitch, Linux Bridge, and Hyper-V. Those are ones whose, whose job is to uh, communicate with the layer two agents. Um, there's Arista, Cisco Networks, TLF, uh, network control system. Those are drivers that can, can drive top of rack switches and kind of configure the core of your network to trunk the VLANs where needed. Um, and then the L2 population, which has been talked about. Um, all these things also you know, deal with the database, deal with uh, the RPC layer. I can go so this is, uh, shows you visually kind of what's going on with multi-segment networks. This whole big arrow is, is, is one network. It's got a network ID. Um, over here, it's VLAN 37 on FizzNet 1. Over here, it's VLAN 413 on FizzNet 2. Um, and tying those together, maybe through different you know, connecting switches or something like that, it's VXLAN uh, with some, some uh, tunnel ID there. So. VMs can connect to any segment that they have that connectivity to. Um, so right now, Neutron and the ML2 plugin don't really do anything to manage the bridging between these segments. That's done administratively. It might be something that you know, is handled by higher level tooling. Uh, but it just has the capability to represent networks made up this way and, and bind virtual interfaces to any of those segments. Um, these there's a new extension called the multi-provider extension. Uh, at least one other plugin also implements this that uh, lets you access these through the API. So ports are associated in the API with the network, not with a specific segment. And uh, port binding covers how the, how, how the appropriate segment gets, gets chosen. Oh, oops. Next slide, please. Sure. There you go. So I said it's a deep dive. We'll show a little code here. Uh, this is I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the type driver API. There's some housekeeping methods up top that we don't need to worry about. Uh, basically, what these are doing is, for, in the case of, uh, let's say, VLANs, managing the pools. So um, allocate tenant segment here is like what would happen when, when a, a normal tenant network is created without any provider attributes. In, inside this driver, there might be a pool of VLANs on different trunks that uh, are available. This is what's going to take care of, within a database transaction, you know, picking one from the pool, marking it as being used, and uh, that'll then be associated with this network and be, be one segment in that network. Uh, the, the same me other methods could be used to add segments to the network. Um, when you're done with a, a network, eventually all the segments are released through this so they can get returned to the pool. And then when provider networks are created, this validate provider segment that's used to just check that the right information has been provided. Uh, and then reserve provider segment that's part of a database transaction that actually uh, marks that segment as being in use. Uh, it may have been, a, a, in case of the VLAN, you know, the same VLAN tag that could have come from the pool. Uh, so you want to make sure it doesn't get allocated uh, you know, to a tenant network as well. Next slide, please. 
uh, even more code. Um, this is the, the mechanism driver API. Uh, basically, there's, again, some housekeeping. But you'll see here, for each of the core resources of Neutron, there's a set of methods. So create network, pre-commit, commit, create network uh, you know, methods here, subnet methods, and port methods there. Uh, there's also a number of methods related to port binding that we'll get into a little more detail on. Um, for each of these actions on each of the uh, resources, you know, there's the create, update, and delete. Uh, there's a pre-commit and a post-commit method. Basically, the pre-commit happens as part of the database transaction. That's, not a, that's something that you want to uh, execute quickly. Um, but then there's a post-commit equivalent method that gets called with the same information. That's where talking to a top of rec switch or talking to a controller and, and so forth can be done outside the transaction. All these methods you'll see take a context argument and, and very little you know, detail. Um, there's a number of different types of context. This is an example. This is the network context. Basically, what this is doing is providing, in the case of an update, access to the, the current, you know, the new values, attributes describing that, uh, that network, uh, also the original ones. So on an update, you can tell what's changed and the list of segments that make up that network. Uh, this approach was taken so that this stuff can evolve with uh, less disruption to existing drivers. You know, if new, new information is added, uh, new methods can be added to the context. Uh, the old ones can be kept working while new, you know, there's been talk of moving sort of from dictionaries to a, an object representation of these things. Um, you know, we can still make the dictionary representation work in terms of the other one, so forth. So the, the idea here is to make the API that the drivers are implementing relatively stable. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So port binding. This is kind of the interesting part here. This is uh, really the, you know, picking which segments being used, picking which mechanism drivers being used. Uh, so basically this gets triggered. Well, from, from an API perspective, if, you're, if you uh, look at a port with admin credentials, you'll see that there's uh, binding attributes, bind, binding VIF type, binding capabilities. Those are things that the plugin sets and there's a binding uh, host ID that Nova sets when it's determined which compute node is, uh, the, the port is being plugged on. Um, so basically, when, when that host ID gets set, or when something happens with the existing binding, there's other, other, other situations that can trig the, trigger this, um, the, the ML2 plugin will walk through all the registered mechanism drivers. They're, they're in order, so they can be prioritized call bind port on each of those. So bind port is, actually, we saw that on the previous slide, passing this, uh, this port context is passed to the bind port call. Um, basically, those, those are each tried in order until one succeeds or all have failed. Um, when a driver's bind port gets called, it can look at information that's available from that context. So there's network segments, uh, there's the host ID attribute, and there's also some hooks to get information about agents. So Neutron has this agent's DB facility. This is basically a, a, a helper function that's going to uh, take the, the host that's being plugged and find out about the agents running on that node uh, of basically the type that, that you're looking for and, and get information about them. That, so then basically for those agent-based drivers, they can look at that. Uh, they need to make sure that the network has a segment with a network type that can be supported. Uh, they need to look at, you know, for the agent that's on that node, does it have a mapping for one of those segments? So in the case of VLANs or, or flat networks, there's a physical network that's, that's important there. Um, that information is available through that uh, agent's DB. So the, uh, the driver can look at that, decide whether connectivity is available there. If it can bind, it's going to call the context set binding method, where's right here, passing in which segment ID has been selected, the VIF type. This will then let the generic VIF driver in Nova know how to, how to plug it. Um, and the capabilities that control things like how, our, uh, um, how uh, security groups are implemented and, and potentially could be extended to handle other things as well. So once one driver succeeds in binding, we're done. Um, if none of them can succeed, then the uh, ML2 plugin sets the VIF type to binding failed. So that could be useful information, trying to debug situations. If, if this doesn't happen, you see that, that uh, 
diff type attribute is winding up in the binding failed state, the thing to really look at is are the agents running where you expect them, are they, are they alive, that sort of thing. Uh, <clears throat> the last slide here? Okay. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for the, the overview on deep dive on the architecture there. So now, now I thought we, would, we could discuss exactly what, what's implemented in Havana with regards to, to ML2. And, and some of this has been covered a little bit in other slides, but this is, these are the exact things that are done. So as far as type drivers, you know, you can create networks with these types for ML2. And these are, these are all, you know, you can do local flat VLAN GRE or VXLAN network types. Um, not all of the mechanism drivers will support these, so it's up to the mechanism drivers to decide, you know, which types they want to support. But, but again, if you, as Bob indicated with the multi-segment API support, you, you could potentially, and bridge is a bad term, but you could bridge these networks together if you needed to um, outside of the scope of ML2. Um, again, here's a list of the mechanism drivers that are supported as well. We kind of talked through these a little bit before. But, but I think what you can see here is there's, there's kind of a nice, a nice ecosystem of, of mechanism drivers that are supported up here as well. And we're hoping that in the ice house cycle that more vendors and even more open source projects decide to, to implement ML2 mechanism drivers. For example, we're looking at um, open daylight as a mechanism driver as well, for an example of an open source project which, which could integrate with ML2 as well in the future. So, so the next two slides are, are, actually, are actually pretty interesting. I thought we'd highlight this L2 population mechanism driver which, which is supported in ML2. Um, and this was done by, by some folks at uh, Orange Telecom uh, and Innovance as well. And it's, it's a great example of the, the type of um, innovation that ML2, that we hope that it will, ML2 will allow people to do. So what, what was done here was, if you look at this, you have kind of your standard um, five host full mesh with, with uh, tunnels here. It doesn't matter if it's GRE or VXLAN. Let's assume this is VXLAN. And so you can see that, that the purple VMs are a part of a one tenant network, and the orangish VMs are part of another tenant network. And you can also see that not all of the hosts have VMs from both of the tenants. For example, host one does not have purple VMs and so forth. So what would happen before, before the L2 population driver in this sort of tunnel configuration with the OVS plugin, for example, if VM A on host one wanted to talk to, to VM G down there on host four, it's going to have to send an ARP request at first. And effectively, what's going to happen is that ARP request is going to be flooded out across the tunnel mesh. But really, host one and host two, they don't have any VMs for that network. So there's really no reason for that to have happened. But now you've done that anyway. So now you've sent that ARP request off. So with uh, ML2, again, we have the similar diagram here with the mesh. What was done was, with the, with the Linux bridge agent, and the Linux bridge agent now has support for VXLAN over the Linux bridge as well. So this, what I'm going to talk about here, is particularly supported with Linux bridge right now. Though support for OVS uh, is going to be done in Icehouse for this. So what was happened now? Now again, you know, we have the same, we have the same thing. VMA wants to talk to VMG in this environment. So with the Linux bridge agent and ML2, instead we actually, we actually do a proxy ARP response here locally on the host, so we don't send the ARP request out at this point. And now, now when they want to communicate, effectively, you know, we're sending the traffic directly rather than broadcasting ARP requests everywhere. So this was kind of a, um, the original blueprint for this was called, um, I forget the, actually, I forget the exact name now, that's pretty silly, but. So this was, a, but effectively, this is, a, this is an optimization for tunnel scalability. Because really, if you look at this full mesh of tunnels, you start talking about hundreds or thousands of hosts, and you start sending broadcast uh, traffic everywhere, it's, you know, you're going to run into scalability problems. So this, this was designed, uh, again, by the Orange folks to specifically solve that particular problem. Okay, go ahead. All right, I'm going to talk for a couple minutes about some of the, the ideas been kicked around during the uh, Design Summit part of uh, the Size Health Summit um, for future work on ML2. So basically, deprecation is, is one item. You've already heard that the monolithic plugins are being deprecated. Um, I think they're actually being removed from the code base right at the end of Ice House or right at the beginning of the J release. I'm not sure which. 
Uh, the, the ML2 plugin supports all their functionality. We want to keep it that way. Uh, so new features aren't, that are being added uh, are being added in ML2 rather than to the monolithic plugins during the ice house phase. Um, and one thing that uh, has been discussed at the design summit and that works underway on is a migration tool. So people who already have deployed um, either the monolithic plugins uh, running Havana, at some point during the Havana phase, will be able to, to, bring, to use this tool as a way to kind of, very, for a very short time, shut down their Neutron server, run this tool that will basically take the existing Open vSwitch or Linux Bridge plugins database and move that information into the tables needed by ML2, then basically bring Neutron server back up with uh, ML2 running, and it'll, it'll connect with the existing running agents. So it's a re relatively manageable uh, cutover. So that tool's gonna be worked on during the Havana cycle. Or excuse me, during the Icehouse cycle. Um, another area is basically, you know, we've got mechanism drivers. Uh, we've got people writing new mechanism drivers for Icehouse. And we also still have people writing new plugins for Icehouse. And a, a lot of existing plugins. Uh, there's a, some discussion going on. There's a, sesh, a design session at, I think, 1.30 today that's going to discuss kind of when's it appropriate to write a new monolithic plugin versus, you know, support your technology through uh, an ML2 mechanism driver. Uh, so some of the advantages of, of using a driver is there's less code. Uh, the main, maintenance is a key part of it there. Uh, another really is that, you know, as new features are added, new extensions, uh, in, you know, integrations with different agents, things like that are always happening. Typically, those have to be updated for every plugin. Plugins can lag behind on that. It's, it's work. They can, you know, there's a lot more uh, chance that the sets of features supported by different plugins is going to vary. Uh, you know, the intent is to, to do that work as, as quickly as possible on the ML2 plugin itself. And any technologies integrated as dr mechanism drivers in that kind of get the advantage for free. Um, so also the support for heterogeneous deployments is an advantage. Oftentimes, you know, if you're you've got some technology that you're using, you wanna to migrate to a new one, there might be a short time when they, they coexist, or, or you may have a, a complicated data center where you really have needs for, for multiple technologies at the same time. Um, so basically, if you're integrating, if you're thinking of writing a new plugin, you should consider whether implementing an ML2 mechanism driver instead makes sense. Uh, also, if you've, you've got an existing plugin, you can consider replacing it with a driver or adding a driver. So uh, the L2 agents, this is basically a deployment, uh, a bit of a heterogeneous situation here where different hosts have the different layer two agents running on them, the ML2 plugin talking to them. Uh, those are all possible right now. Um, one of the things we're looking at whether to do is to try to develop a modular layer two agent. So the idea here is that the same agent could run on different nodes and have drivers supporting the different kind of virtual switching technologies. Um, this could also support special features, you know, um, SRIOV, things like that. PCI pass-through is under a lot of discussion in Nova. You know, maybe those things would, would plug into these agents easier and, and re help eliminate the, the, the tendency to, to clone an agent and add a feature. Okay. Demo. Okay. Okay. Dr. Kyle. Okay. So now we're gonna we're gonna go through and do a demo of, of ML2 in action here. So I'll really quickly, what this is gonna show, this is gonna show multiple uh, ML2 mechanism drivers working uh, with the Open vSwitch uh, agent mechanism driver and the Cisco Nexus mechanism driver as well. Uh, we're gonna boot VMs on multiple compute hosts uh, running Fedora, and we're gonna basically configure VLANs across you know, the virtual and the physical infrastructure here as well. So this is an incredibly hard to read example of what the demo is gonna be, but you can see that host one effectively is acting as a compute node and also a controller node running uh, the OpenStack infrastructure. Host two is effectively only running uh, Neutron. Yeah, Neutron. Um, then we've got our Cisco Nexus switch down there. Um, we're going to configure things up. Um, let's see. Next. I did this VM appeared on host Oh, one. yeah, there we go. VM one is going to appear on host one over there. And Effectively, a VLAN is going to be added on, on the VIF for that VM there as well, and also on the BRE2 ports by the ML2 OBS mechanism driver. And then we're going to 
We're going to also then add that VLAN to the trunk port on the Nexus switch down there. And then effectively the same thing is going to happen on host two. We're going to bring up a VM over there, and we're going to add the, the VLAN on the VIF there, add it on the, the Cisco Nexus switch as well, and then um, magically they'll be able to ping each other, I think is the final thing. There we go, yes. We've completed the standard network test as well. Okay, so let's get, let's get to the demo here. Yeah, give me one second. Actually, so actually a show of hands, how many people have used either the Open vSwitch or Linux Bridge plugins? Anybody? Okay, how many people have used them in DevStack? Okay, what about in, in either a production cluster or like a, a test cluster or what they're trying to use? Okay, so that's a pretty good, that's pretty good actually. Okay, just let me, um, let me just mirror this uh, display. There is mirroring arrangement. Oh, we already set up for mirroring. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So here we go. So this is your standard Horizon dashboard. But before we get to that, what I'm going to show you is, I think this should show up. That shows up pretty good. Okay. So here's here's the interface to the Nexus switch. And what I wanted to show was was right now we don't have any VLANs created down there other than VLAN 1, and we do not, and if we look at the configuration for these ports, right now, this one's set up as a trunk port, it doesn't have any VLANs allowed, and the same thing for this one. So those are the, those are the, the ports connected to the two hosts. So now we'll go ahead and log in uh, right here. So this is, this is the standard Horizon interface. You can see we've got two, two hypervisors here. So we will go ahead and in the demo project here, launch a bunch of instances. Let's go ahead and launch. Let's launch five, just so we can, just so we can get it to balance them across multiple hosts here because my two compute nodes are a little bit unbalanced. Uh, oh, I forgot to select an image, there we go. Okay, so it's going to build all of these. We'll go over back over to the admin tab so we can have a look at where at where they land. And you can see that. So it's I think you can make that out. Uh, the host column, which is the second column from the left, actually shows you where which host the they've landed on. Um, four of them ended up on the compute the, the compute slash controller node because it has more RAM and more resources than the other node as well, but one of them ended up over there. So while these are, while these are booting, let's flip back over here to the, to the Nexus switch and we can see, actually wait, before we do that, one thing I wanted to show you was if we look at these networks here and we click on this network, you can see as far as the provider attributes go, that's a little hard to read, but it actually says segmentation ID 240. So since we're using VLANs, um, Neutron picked VLAN 240 out of the pool we gave it for this particular network. And now if we go over here to the, to the Nexus switch, uh, we can actually see that VLAN 240 was created down here. It's a little bit hard to make out, I think. But, and we can actually also now see, if we look, uh, you know, we trunked this VLAN on this port as well when, when the, the VMs came up, and same with the other one as well. So they both had VLAN 240 added as well. If we created another tenant network, it would assign a different VLAN from the VLAN pool that you gave it as well. Now, if we go back over here, um, let's see. Actually, one thing I wanted to show was as well as this here. So the control node is also running the network services for Neutron, which means it's running DHCP. So you can see right here, it, the DHCP server for this tenant network got assigned 10.0.0.2 as well. So we'll go over here to, to this as well. We'll look at the console for this VM here. And we're just using standard Cirrus images for this. So we'll go ahead and log in. Uh, I think I typed the password wrong. There we go. Okay. So you can see this particular VM got assigned address 10.0.0.3. So we should be able to ping the, 
Uh, and this, this VM specifically was on the second host, not the control node, so it's not running the neutron network services, right? So, so we can, you know, yay, we did a ping, right? But just to show you that it's, that it's really working, if we actually go into to one of these interfaces here and shut down that interface, you know, the ping stopped, right? So now we can go ahead and unshut that interface and, and um, get the ping traffic working. So it was a real demo, right? So there we go. <laughs> I think that may be the best response ever for a ping demo in the history of network. <laughs> so you guys rock. So, okay. So I think we, I think we have a few, uh, a few minutes here. I mean, we'd be happy to take any questions that anyone might have. Um, are there any microphones available? Um, oh, perfect. Okay. Uh, can you show the configuration, how you, uh, the order in which the mechanism drivers are specified? Oh, sure. We can take a look at the uh, configuration as well. Um, just a second here. Um, although, just a sec. So if we look at the configuration, now this is, for the demo, we're, we're using two dev stack VMs effectively right here. Uh, for simplicity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's going to potentially, is that a little better? One more. There we go. How's that? Sorry. Good? So let's take a look at uh, the Neutron here, ML2. So this is what the, the configuration file looks like. I, let's go a little bit bigger even. Is that, that's pretty huge. Okay, so we're, we're setting up in the ML2 section, for example, VLANs. We're also loading all of the type drivers um, because that's what DevStack will do by default. It's not a requirement. You can load just the type drivers you want as well. And you can see we're loading the Open vSwitch, Linux Bridge, and Cisco Nexus uh, agents as well. So the other interesting parts of this uh, configuration are... Uh, VLAN ranges, that's the 240. Yeah, exactly, right there. You can see the network VLAN ranges. That's where we've assigned VLANs 240 to 249 for FizzNet 1. And um, the rest of this is pretty standard. Um, you know, we have some OVS configuration options that are used because you could create a network, a GRE network, with this configuration as well. Um, you're not limited to just VLANs with ML2 here as well. So, yes? Kyle, uh, great demo, by the way. Um, I, I, Thanks. My question was, uh, Bob, you are showing the, uh, when you're trying to do a port binding, trying to go through, figure out which mechanism driver to use. Yes. Is it possible to pass a hint? Um, that's something uh, for the future. I mean, I think okay. kind of a, a general quality of service approach or something like that where you can kind of declare things that would be, the mechanism drivers be able to take that into account in deciding whether they can provide the needed connectivity. Uh, in the Grizzly release, the Cisco driver really didn't do much when you did GRE tunnels. Is there any more functionality implemented in it uh, for sure. GRE tunnels or VXLANs in Havana? So I should preface that by saying that, that it did actually use the open. So this, a similar architecture to this was existed in the Cisco plugin uh, previously and actually still does in, in uh, Havana as well. Um, we're, we're currently, you know, deciding. It's likely that we'll move everything to ML2 would be my guess, but yeah, in the ISO cycle. Yes? Uh, what role will the ML2 play in delivery of QoS and bandwidth reservation? Is it part of the roadmap or it, it's, it's relevant in the, in the discussion? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, for QoS, there was actually a design summit discussion around uh, QoS extension APIs for Neutron. Um, you know, that might fall under a broader policy type of model in Neutron, perhaps, but certainly that would be implemented in this, you know, a reference implementation of, of any sort of QoS APIs would be implemented in ML2. Yeah, the idea is to you know, implement those yeah. extensions, usually right. initially in, in ML2, if possible, yeah. package the, the mechanics of that as a mechanism driver, so it's something you can, you can use if you want, leave it, out, leave it out if you don't need it, or if, if you don't want to introduce the risk. Mm -hmm. um, right. So yes. Yeah, you're really happy to see, finally, this kind of improvement, really. You know, you, how painful it was when we used, like, a neutron initially. But finally, it seems like we got to this point where all necessary framework seems like we can really enjoy. So thanks for that. Uh, just a quick question. When you actually, de you know, demonstrate this one, actually, for the next side, uh, did you use, actually, open flow, open flow protocol or not? Or for, for the next yeah, side? Yeah, 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 no, yeah. no, no. It's just it's using uh, uh, just NetConf APIs, okay. just like the existing okay. Thank you. Cisco yeah. plugin. Yeah. Okay. But it is possible also to utilize the open flow protocol. In I mean, certainly it's like the, the mechanism driver itself, whatever API it wants to use okay. uh, to talk to 
either the switches, the controller, whatever, it, it's, it's up to the mechanism Thank driver. You. Yep. Yeah. What's yeah. different uh, in the ML2? Is it a complete new set of tables or? Well, the, the core tables are still the same. I mentioned that it uses the same base class that implements the core attributes of the core resources. So really what ML2 adds is its own specific mapping of uh, networks to segments and the details of each of those segments uh, and some information about the port binding that, that gets stored in the database as well. So. Uh, you know, the idea is that when you do that migration, the, the network UUIDs and, and details, you know, all your subnets, that, that, that they don't get touched. Uh, it's really just the, the information that used to be in a open vSwitch or Linux bridge specific table will be recreated in the ML2 mechanism, or type drivers table, actually. Okay. Can we share information across vendor uh, plugins? So, so like, what, what type of information? Um, like the VLAN configuration. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's what the abstraction of the, the type drivers and the mechanism drivers allows. So uh, the VLAN ID specific for this network that Neutron picked, if, for example, we also had um, the Arista top of rack driver in there, um, it, would, it would share that same VLAN ID for that same Neutron network as well, and can configure that on the Arista switches as well. Can we do it dynamically? Like, what I meant is, it is taking 240, right? Here on the trunk port, do, do we need to configure everything, or can we use just 240 to be configured on the Cisco, Cisco port? So, so the Cisco plugin dynamically configures that VLAN for you on the ports, and I believe the Arista plugin does as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Any questions? Okay. Well, well thanks for coming, everyone. We hope you learned some stuff. Thank you.